afternoon again and a welcome to the students. Uh, we have a special occasion today for, uh, normally this is for faculty and staff, but also today we warmly welcome those students who are here as the finalists of nationally competitive scholarships going on right now and practice their ability to uh, real professors and be real as well. And a warm welcome to all the faculty and staff colleagues to this edition of Westwood Lecture started by Mitch uh, and always uh, arranged with great care by Anthony and Kathleen and the whole team here. Thank you. And this is really one of the most exciting days I look forward to every semester is to be a student uh, and go to a lecture without worrying about well, there's going to be a final exam at the end. <laughs> Unless so many give us an exam at the end, please don't. Uh, in fact, I'm going to sneak out, uh, not because I want to avoid the exams, but because uh, there's another ongoing event I need to be there, but the amazing uh, Liu D in the back, Bernie Engels, is going to help close out with Q&A. Now, as a community of scholars, of curious, open minds, uh, I think this is particularly fitting to have uh, the community get together at Westwood on a monthly basis to talk about different topics. And today we are delighted to have a great colleague from College Bank to talk about digital forestry. Now, I've been brainwashed by my <laughs> ad colleagues <laughs> that we would like to, in the Purdue effort in digital forestry, or generally speaking, digital agriculture 2.0, to count every tree and crop in the country, in the world, in the world, starting with Indiana. And this is a powerful, innovative, beautiful combination of forestry, natural resources on the one hand, and all the digital tools on the other, including sensing, data processing, drones, AI, laser. So this combination is not only an important pillar in Purdue moves, next moves, but also an essential foundation in what we talk about in physical AI these days, talking about curating open data sets uh, for natural resources that's going to be led by Purdue and Purdue College Bank and other colleges faculty. Uh, I've listened to shorter versions of this talk uh, from some in a few times. So I always wanted to listen to the full 45 minute version of it. Uh, and I cannot thank Sony enough for leading the Institute of Digital Forestry and leading the next moves and working along with many colleagues, some of you here this evening, uh, to advance to produce mission. And let's go count every tree and crop in the world. And I give you an amazing Sony. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, President, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for the audience to be here. And before I start, I do want to pay a little token here and uh, for allow us to be here. So representing uh, digital forestry, this is uh, uh, something for you. Okay, wow. <laughs> and, and this is for the, oh, I think the one for the first lady. Ah, okay. Great. Uh, well, with all the ice creams I was eating, I'm not going to fit in there. But uh, <laughs> uh, maybe one day I'll fit on this. Thank you. All right. So um, today I'm going to share with you uh, the digital innovation that we're working together. First, I'm trying to uh, make it clear that this is not one man's work. This is a, a representation of 30 some plus uh, faculty members across five colleges and 14 departments. And so let's begin. Um, I want to start with a picture. Now I don't, you know, you, earlier in the summer, you remember that the smoke that came through uh, from uh, Canada that uh, gets here, right? So. Some of you have to cancel activities, some of you have to stay indoors. And so this news used to be distant. Used to be only say, hey, it's California's problem, it's not a problem. But I think these are, you know, a, a problem that of many, many people. Um, the second 
is that, you know, our population continue growing. You know, we see outside beautiful forests outside, right? This is, by the way, we run actually our lab outside of this, the horticulture park. And, but with the in continued growth of people, how are we gonna be able to, you know, sustainably make all the furniture, all the floors, all the fibers, all the uh, other stuff that we care about? In addition to that, um, you know, you guys heard a lot of stuff that are currently going on about carbon neutrality, right? A lot of the companies say, now we are carbon neutral. Um, but if you hear some of the other uh, uh, news in, out there, like even NPI is saying, well, you know, it's about 70 some percent of these uh, carbon projects are not real, they are fake. I didn't say, what? Like, that might be a surprise to you. The reason for that is that Currently, there is not a good system in terms of monitoring, measuring, and reporting this. So whatever you report, it is what you, you know, have to believe. So there is a issue with accountability. And lastly, I want to point out uh, uh, one thing. If you remember the summer, how many days in the city of Phoenix above 100 degrees? Right. This is uh, like many days. I don't even remember, it was news, right? And uh, so the cities need to be built a little bit smarter, you know, to reduce the heat islands and to uh, re remove the pollution and so on. And so trees are one of the solutions. If we plant them well, then we have a better city. If we plant them well, then we can achieve what we call the environmental justice to allow the, you know, whether you're poor or you're wealthy, to have the shared benefits of what trees provide to you. All right, now um, I saw one of my students in my class, Grace, in the, in the audience over there. But I'm going to start with a picture over here, okay? So this is a picture, I mean, it's based on the, you know, it's, an, it's a black and white picture, right? It was taken at uh, the beginning of the last century, okay? And it looks like professional. I mean, the person is, you know, using a stick to measure a tree. And here's today. And, uh, the, you know, this is a photo from some of these activities, 4-H activities. And you imagine, you're trying to, I mean, you know, on the picture, it looks nice. We have a, a two kids and trying to do a measurement. But imagine, you know, behind the scene, once the camera is went away, how can we win the attention of playing the video games versus this? Right? So... There is an issue about we are cheating out our next generation. And I am kind of feel guilty about this. Even my own class that I'm teaching, majority of the tools that we're talking about, I teach a biometrics class, which is, you know, about measurement of trees. We still teach some of the old technologies to our future generation of workforces. And on the other hand, all the digital technology are out there, right? Some of you drive a, a Tesla, which is autopilot driving, right? We heard about, you know, the Starlink. So all these technologies, sensor technologies are existing. So what we need to do is bring this technology into the reality and into the field that is matters us so much and everyone's dependent on, but most often we take it for granted. So this is why, and I, I'm going to put in the tagline that uh, uh, President Mon has been uh, enjoying, which is, we hope to measure every single tree on the planet. But that's a moonshot goal. We have to take a baby step at a time. Um, so what we are doing here, well, we are interested in a couple of areas. One of it, obviously, we want to make this measurement autom automated, right? But with this information, if we just measure trees, who cares, right? Because they are just trees. But we want, what we want to do is take the measurement into the next step, such as you know, how you can uh, a, a better monitor them in terms of uh, like insect breaks or health in, in general. How can we better manage them so we can have better growth and so on? 
right? And then also we want put one put this together so that we have the next generation workforce that can be compete globally. And so what I'm going to work with uh, with you together on this in the next couple of uh, a set of slides is that thinking about how Purdue Digital Forestry have been working together. Now, on this diagram, there are uh, 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 four circles over here. We have in a circle at the bottom, which is you know, high, sort of uh, what we call the proximal sensing. Right? You have uh, these high resolution gears, very close to the ground, and you can get a, a amazing quality data. But you can only do maybe a horticulture park as, as, as an area. And then you can, beyond that, you can start thinking about the other tools that we out there have. You, you heard about drones, um, uh, you know, or, uh, and then we can move on to the, the uh, aerial uh, uh, platforms like a fixed wind plane or a satellite. But current knowledge boundary is somewhat along these diagonal lines that when you are going out for the space uh, or for the distance away, the less resolution that you get. And so this is sort of an, a, a, a boundary that many you know, uh, people have been struggled with. But how can we bring these all stuff all together that somehow we will together move this to the corner a bit to break the boundary, to push the knowledge boundary a bit. And that's some of the story that I'm gonna share with you uh, in the next set of the slides. So, um, the first thing that we have been working very busy on is called an e-forester. Um, and it's basically a smartphone app, right? So, and the reason we're choosing this is this. Almost everyone has a smartphone, right? A phone. And second, almost everyone can know how to use it. Right? So with that, we're thinking, well, can we put a, some traditional knowledge that takes a long time to train for, put it into the, 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 the phone, and then you can have a forester in your pocket. What that does is, is in a sense, is what called a democratization of a knowledge in, for special like our, our rural landowners or you know, other sectors that they do not have the knowledge about. We can put that into their pocket. And we can tell them using this tool what species they have, you know, uh, size and volume or carbon or, or, or uh, value, whichever that of their interest, right? And uh, so I'm gonna give you a little sneak peek because this is a lecture. I have to touch a little bit of what is inside of this, right? How do you build this? So, you know, you take a phone, uh, uh, you use your phone, take a photo. This is normally what you get. But by the way, do you know that you pick, your phone also takes these kind of camp, uh, pictures? They just don't see them, okay? And then, but if you can put them together, then you can create amazing information. So this is um, close to Halloween time, and I'll use a Halloween uh, example over here, is that if you, you know, uh, uh, wander somewhere, you come up with a skeleton, and you say, oh, what kind of person was that? Well, based on skeleton, you cannot tell the identity of that person, right? And then somehow it happened to be there isn't a, a, a picture by the skeleton. Maybe that belongs to the same people. So what you can do is that and you slap that picture on top of that skeleton. Now the skeleton come to life. See, you can now tell the, the, that, that, that identity in 3D. And this is what this process is about. And by the way, one of the uh, people in the audience, Dr. Garza, is one of the professors that are uh, uh, you know, part of this project. And so we can use this to achieve, because again, use the phone as an example, is the, the native resolution for the, like, the, the LIDAR is about two inches. With this technology, what we can do now is half a centimeter level of accuracy. So I'm going to quickly and I, uh, give you a sneak peek of what the app is, looks like. This is in a beta version. It hasn't been released yet, but this is a, what your phone normally would be able to see, right? You see, the, you see me and you see that. But if you switch this camera, you see what's behind the scene. 
right? And then you can use this technology, and then you can, you know, a, a do a measure, take a snapshot, and then everything can be measured to the uh, sub-centimeter level, okay? So that's one of the tools that we have been working on that we hope to release very soon. Um, and we have, you know, species ID libraries, the uh, diameter measures done. So we're hoping to release by December or so. Um, and we are taking this technology, in, uh, even though there are different sense of packages, into a similar way, but it's a more advanced way of <clears throat> doing drones under the canopy. Okay. So this time, the drone doesn't have a laser a, a sensor into it, but it has what called a video. The drone can take videos. Once you have the video, I know like uh, uh, Dr. Sunil over there, they, they know the computer the graphics people, they, they can use this technology to turn the pictures into depth field. Okay? And so here's an, just a little video of showing you what you see in your, in your eye or in the RGB camera, at which is at the top, and what you can convert this to as what's called a depth field, right? And then there, there's a multiple technologies that is behind this. You need to train the AI to identify individual trees, and you need to have the calibration engineering solutions to tell how big, the, how, how far away you are. So now you think about it. this is now you can do Go through, the drone is going through the underneath the canopy. Every tree is being identified, size is being measured. And now it's no longer a stick that is counting against every single individual tree, but it is an automated process. And another uh, uh, effort that we have been working on is how to do this instead of you know, the, the, uh, again, a, a, a patch at a time. How can we do this at a scale? And so one of the things that we've been working on what called a mobile mapping system. Now, this is an, a picture of, uh, uh, actually, we call it a backpack. It intentionally exposed all this sort of its guts to, for you to, to take a look at it. And a fun factor to point it out is that, uh, you know, this is a lighter. But there is an, a, a, uh, behind this, this is the a GPS system, or GNS system, that is used on the missile. The, 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 the missile that you, know, you, you heard about in the war that uh, goes, uh, uh, this is the level of accuracy of a, 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 a GPS sensor. So it gets to this less a millimeter level of accuracy when you are doing the navigation. Now you may wonder, well, if you get that, couldn't you do bad things with this? Well, this is the one the technology, that military technology turns into the civil use. So this thing can detect. If you do zero to 60 miles within, you know, second or so, the system gonna shut down. So you know you are doing bad things, so, right? So, but anyway, this is the system that built here by uh, one of our engineering professor. Uh, Dr. Habib, he uh, cannot be here today. But um, we have now been working together to build this, not only just as a backpack, but we can place them on the drone. So I'm gonna show you two cases of how the applications of this can be uh, uh, used. And I started with an, a, a, a forest plantation. This is a, a plantation that has a, a Good collaboration with us. This is Alba America that uh, Dr. Uh, Genzo here is at, uh, you know, we had this long-term long collaboration. And uh, Alba America has these plantations that they think, uh, because this is a black walnut plantation. So for those of you who do not know what black walnut, well, it's in a tree and you eat the nuts normally, but the tree itself is very valuable. If you have a nice size, what we call the veneer quality tree, say 30 inches in diameter, that tree could have worth you know, $3,000 or $6,000, depending on the quality itself. So they have been manually using a stick to measure every tree every year. And because it's, it's a lot of money that is, uh, uh, could potentially be raised. And so with some of the help that like Dr. Saunders in the back, that we were able to demonstrate, hey, trust us, we can do this in a much different way and a much faster way. So this is a drone-based solution. 
And we can take the, uh, uh, using the uh, light sensor on the drone, and then the, we can get all the point cloud, and we can turn them into individual trees. Not only that, we can tell which tree has branches taller or uh, lower, which is smaller or bigger. If you're going to harvest, if you're going to thin them out, we can tell you which one to take them out. And so this is the technology can be used in a high value place or can be utilized in some other projects. So I'll tell you a trip that I hope to get on, which is going to happen in a week or two. Um, the uh, company, the big company you guys all know, Amazon, they have a, what's called a global uh, sustainability project, which is a, a you know, billion dollar project. But they wanted to address one of the issues that I mentioned earlier, the carbon neutrality issue. Is there a tool, is there a system that actually can allow you to calculate, to uh, report, to monitor the carbon? So we're going to go to the sponsored by the Amazon, go to the Amazon forest. We're going to Brazil to test out on the uh, agro uh, forest and to see how much of carbon actually they captured. Um, but the plantation is a relatively easy system to work with because trees are lined up, right? So what about like horticultural park like right over here? Well, this is something that what we've done uh, in the, um, the Martel Forest, which is our research forest uh, uh, that's seven miles, well, from here is probably six miles uh, off campus. But here's just, and again, I want to you know, uh, give you a little uh, peek in, inside of how this works, is that this is what the product of lighter point cloud look like. We color them by height, so taller is getting uh, uh, the, the, the uh, green, uh, the, the red looking, and the ground is blue, so it's all based on height. Then what you can do is that you can train an AI for that, for the millions of points into a recognition of, hey, this is actually not only the point cloud, but it belongs to individual trees and which part of the tree, whether it's a crown, whether it's a ground, and then you can fit it, and so no longer you need a stick to measure, you can estimate what is it, if this is a traditional measure, what called the diameter. You can say what's the diameter is that, you can fit a circle around it, but you can do any height that you want it, right? It's no longer, so, so that will pr provide you all the precisions that you. So I'm gonna show you again another quick video here. This is in a, a, a 40 acres of land that is at Martel, we call it the Plot 4D, it has a unique name for it. And um, uh, data acquisition it takes 30 minutes, and then we, we uh, uh, 40 minutes, we put them in a, a, a cluster, a, a computer, and then it takes about 20 minutes. Now every single tree on the 40 acre is being measured. Okay, and now I want to connect you a little bit back over here in terms of like so these are just canopies taking off. Each of the tree is just the trunk of the individuals. So what what do we care about this? Well, you see these these are these green things are the number of timbers, if you are interested in timbers, that can, be, uh, that can be harvested from that site. Or if you're interested in carbon, that's uh, tons of carbon that can be stored. The other thing that on this is this uh, 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 brown thing over here, these are the downwardy debris. And so in wildfire situation, these are what called the 100 hour or 1,000 hour fields. If the fire catch them, they can be burned for days, for days, okay? And so if you can map out where the risks are located, you can have an, a good way to think about management of our risk of the landscape of fire and related stuff. And for harvest efficiency purposes, because this technology is available, before you set your foot on the, on the land or you, know, you think about where are the, uh, the uh, materials they add, how many trucks that you needed, so efficiency can come into place. How to minimize the impact can also be, you know, uh, come into place. Um, so I promised in my title that uh, I will give a little bit about digital twins, but this is also a very exciting thing 
that uh, is happening. Now, with all the data that you captured, you can play with them. And then you can make use of them in a, a positive way. So you may want to start with, like, that's a crazy idea, right? Beautiful and natural forest right outside. Why do I even care about create a digital twin about it? Because I want to enjoy the nature. Well, we think about it differently, about a couple of ways. If you are a firefighter, if, if you are the first time you jump into the firefighting, would you rather be actually in the fire or would you want to be in, in a simulated environment thinking about how to create my safety? Right? That's one scenario. Or we'll think about it that way. Uh, in, in another way, is that, you know, yes, we can enjoy the go out and enjoy and take a hike, but not everyone can do that. There are people with uh, wheels, right? There are other situations. So you don't, so what if we can bring these digital twins into the people who cannot have access to them? And so that would have been an, you know, another potential you know, scenario. Then I saw Dr. Pichinowski in the back uh, over there. Like, this is the, what he, one of his work is putting soundscapes into the, the brand to the people, right? So you'd seen this, an, an idea of whether it's a digital forest, put the sounds back in here, you, make, you can simulate the world. And so here's just an, an, a quick uh, a cartoon about a video about how this works. Right? You have the scans, and then you can um, uh, uh, think about you know, stitching all these uh, uh, point clouds together. But you not only you can uh, stitch the point cloud together, once you have these digital twins, then you can manipulate it. You never feel guilty you cut that tree down because that's, that's in, the, in the digital world, right? And you can simulate how winds blow gonna impact it or snow can blow, uh, you know, impact it. And so that allows you lots of flexibility to do a lot of interesting things with. Um, and this, this is the, uh, you know, this is the one, the sum of the collaboration with your club, uh, faculty in the computer science department. And, uh, and the other thing we're working on is that not only simulated, but also of thinking about how to do it in the fine detail. So here's an, an example of, you know, the different geometries of different species, because you know, if you are some natural resource related, and now we're looking at Grace over there, she probably gonna be able to drive and say, oh, here's a maple, here's an oak. How could she tell with the geometry that is the tree is associated with? Well, we can put this into the, now we can make the actual thing turn into more close to the reality. And I want to point out one more thing related to this digital twin uh, concept here is that you not only worry about the above ground, but it can be using this link to the below ground stuff. And so I saw Dr. Yan over here that, you know, his lab uh, is primarily doing this CT scans of the, the tools and uh, uh, the, the roots and all that. We can construct them, link them together. Now you not only have the above ground stuff that normally was an essential you can have, but you can understand how the blue ground works, where the carbon is stored, how the trees grow in reaction to nutrient and to uh, uh, parent material and so on and so forth. So you are, again, making the connections between the real world and digital world and you can do a better understanding and a better management and better utilization of. Um, I want to uh, highlight one more uh, 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 challenge that we are facing and working on. So this is about an, a, a, a utilizing satellite images to do tree counting. And so, uh, I, 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 not because this was, I did have a bad uh, image here, but this is actually the very good images over here, okay? This is an image from what's called a planet lab. And they have about three meters of resolution from satellite. They can do daily data capturing. So that's the kind of data that you have. And it's currently one of the sort of state of the art data. And we have an ongoing collaboration with them. The idea is that how can you make sense of this image to tell me, hey, actually, here's a tree, here's a tree. And you would say, you're lying to me because I don't see a single tree over here, right? And so the, the reason we want to do this, and again, we want to make sure that, you know, 
not only tell the, the uh, we, we can't, because trees again, sh can sh shade your house and you know, do all the good things that you want. But we, again, the, the, do it manually is too expensive. City of Chicago spent next year, they plan to spend $2 million just to inventory count how many trees there are on the street. So this is a highly contested area. Google is actually working on it. Um, and uh, you know, Microsoft is interested in this. And so this is in a, in a way that how we do this. And, and again, the sneak peek inside of this is this. Well, you know, because of this uh, satellite imagery that we have, is, it's a daily in, uh, available image. And so we can you know, not take all of them, but we take each one from each month. And each of the image actually not only have RGB, but have a near infrared. So there's a four band, four times by uh, 12, you can have 48 bands of information. So now you start can see stuff that you cannot, uh, your naked eye cannot see. So we train the model, and then I'm going to skip the, the detail, but basically what this does is almost in the chat GPT version of, okay? And so um, you, you feed these images into the model and give it some rules. And fortunately, a tree is most often in the city landscape is, you know, either, here are the four models, there, right? There's a, you know, street tree model, and there is a like park model, there's a backyard model and so on. So then you can use this to generate. And here's what we're showing you here is that we have an a, a area around the Indianapolis Zoo. Okay. Currently, accuracy of those are around 90 some percent, depending on the, uh, where you are at. But uh, this not only works in the US, it works somewhere uh, in Africa. We try, tried it on Africa now. But back to US here though, we now have mapped 330 uh, US uh, cities, okay? And there's a currently so far, there's a 270 million trees being counted. And, uh, you know, whether it's in San Francisco, or Atlanta, or New York City. Um, the accuracy, again, is uh, over 90 some percent. And the beauty for things, once the model has been trained, you can transfer learn it to other locations. Um, and I started with an education, and I'm gonna uh, close, uh, finish off. I have two more slides to go. Um, but we are serious about the education component as well. So with uh, some of the help uh, primarily headed by Dr. Saunders back here over there is that we now have a digital natural resource miner on the book. So for whoever you guys are interested, hey, we have a miner there for you to take. And uh, we are uh, trying to do an, a, a dry run next summer to do a, um, what we call digital forestry certificate. This is a, something that actually the professional has been asking about. Can we learn how to fly the drone to get the data and to do the different things that you promised? This looks you know, very fancy. Can we get our hands on it? So we are working on diligent on that. And also we are working on a professional masters that you know, for the people who are already in the workforce, they want to be update uh, their skills. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on. And I want to uh, uh, give you an, an, a, a little peek into what we are moving forward with some of the areas. And again, uh, you know, uh, it, it's in a cross-disciplinary collaboration and effort over here. But I want to highlight one of the things that I think we should uh, 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 spend a lot of energy on. It's about the wildfire, right? Whether this is the Wi-Fi about identify the, the heated, uh, the, the on the ground fuels that could cause major fire breaks and spread, or with this landscape scale of fire risk analysis is because a lot of the time fires started with actually not on trees, on the grass uh, uh, blades and dry material. But if you have an infrastructure, a, a structure of, you know, herbaceous shrub, uh, herbaceous species and shrubs, they can 
quickly spread. And so Dr. Jenkins in the back, he's interested in working on some of that uh, work. And by the way, this morning, I got a phone call from uh, Canada and there's a Canadian company. They want us to work with them. They, they somehow heard about us. They can you help us with the wildfire situation? Um, so uh, we have scheduled a meeting uh, to talk about it this Friday. Or to the, you know, the stuff that we uh, talked about, uh, post, if unfortunately wildfire happened, if there's a, you know, a disaster relief effort that need going on, how that we can quickly make it happen. Here's just one example of the campfire you guys heard about uh, in California, right? This is before fire and this is after fire, you see. The green dots are indicating the, the trees were used to be in the white are the buildings. And you see a lot of buildings destroyed, the trees are dis, uh, destroyed. But with this, you can assess something at a large scale quickly. Um, and we also are uh, working on something. Uh, this is an, a new effort that is, um, uh, I feel it's very exciting. So on this is a, uh, uh, one of the professors from ECEs uh, uh, um, that what they have done is they have developed some unique sensors, taking what called the noise is uh, opportunistic uh, signals, right? Jim Garrison's work is that because we all send, make phone calls and communications all the time, but this, there's a lot of these signals are bouncing off us. These signals actually can be utilized to turn into something useful. And so uh, his lab has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, tested out some of the sensor antennas that to do a couple of interesting things. One is that, can we use these signals to do soil moisture, which is one of the uh, opportunities that we can uh, find. Second, what are the biomasses, whether this is the, biomass for the trees or biomass for the crops or biomass, you, you know. And so this will be one of the areas that can do it in a large scale because uh, we're hoping to send a satellite into the sky to do this. And so that will allow a large scale predictions and risk mapping associated with the Wi-Fi fighting. So I believe that is my last uh, uh, slides over here. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about us, we're updating our website, but we it's an, a constantly uh, have uh, you know, uh, uh, stories or new areas that are posted over there. And thank you for the attention. And I'll oh, you know, happy to answer questions. Plenty of questions. I think we've got about uh, 20 minutes to be specific. So, Chris, I won't know everyone's name, but I know Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, you can say something about, soil, uh, about the, you know, tree health. Obviously, you can put multi temporal data, and uh, did you have some sort of vision for that to, to monitor, for example, the problem? Areas from, from or any kind of disease yeah, that's a very good question. And I did not have time to dabble into this area because I was uh, under the impression I only have 30 minutes. I already, uh, but anyway, um, we have actually two professors right, sitting right over here that is uh, working on something related to the forest health. Right. So, um, but we are working on this through this several different way. One is that uh, uh, hyperspectral remote sensing that allows you to understand some of the stresses and disease outbreaks. That so, uh, Dr. Kato is not here, but his most of his work is related to the um, uh, disease detections and health. But we also are doing, uh, uh, we have ongoing collaboration with Dr. Jian uh, Jin uh, over here that, you know, to do the disease detection at the leaf level. So um, 
it's uh, one of the dreams that we have here is that we will create a disease library that with some spectral signals and you compare this, ah, that's that disease. But that's one of the, but the, the other area is that how can you do it in the larger scale? We're talking about small scale. How can you do it in larger scale? Then you'll have to scale this up from the, whatever you learned at the local level to connect to what you can see either from an airplane or from the satellite. And so this is one of the most challenging area, but this is the most exciting area as well. So how to learn this scale up. So this is, uh, uh, you know, super resolution data that you have to, uh, uh, super resolutionize the data that you have either from the satellite imagery or you bring the downscale to the high level. So there's a lot of exciting work that can be done in this. That hand. Yeah. Um, I have a question. And I'll preface this by saying that my dad was very involved in um, the environmental movement when he was in college. So I grew up like literally hugging trees. Okay. So this is very interesting. Okay. So first question. You guys are doing a lot of I assume it's a lot, I mean to cap every single tree on earth is a very, very large and you definitely need that goal. What's stopping you from using pre existing data to collect it from like Google Maps? Or, you know, because there are already a lot of drones in research collecting the images of the drones, right? So, like, what's up when you've been looking at that? Those images are in existence and those are your analysis. So, right. that's question number one. Question number two, I can repeat it. Okay. Question number two is like, let's say you collect all this stuff and this is awesome, and then just when you finish counting the last tree on earth, there's a wildfire. And then, so there are X amount of trees on this day at this time, at this second, and the next second, X minus how many trees are burned down. Okay. Right, so how are you gonna update your system? Right. And like how often? And then number three, like, sorry. Yeah, number fine. three, like what defines a tree, right? Cause like, is right. it a stump? Is it a sapling? Let's say huh. you're in a national park and there's like a really, really good fake tree. Or like, what if someone's really tall? Or like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what if it's like a tall All right, all right. I really like these questions, which means she has been thinking. So start with question number one. Why don't we utilize the existing? Uh, well, we do, okay? These are our training data. These are allow us to understand, like we utilize lots of data from like city of Chicago. We utilize a lot of data from New city of New York or even our own campus data. This allows you to train, okay? Because it's not going to waste. These are valuable, ex uh, expensively to get ground data that we want to have, okay? So that's one to answer you. So we are, we, we are utilizing whatever we have, but the uh, information needed to be to get at a fine resolution so you can make sense of the data. Okay, so that's one. Um, the, uh, I'll start with your third question about how to tell this different, what, uh, you know, of this uh, trees and give you, uh, uh, if you are taking remote sensing 101, you will know. You, Purdue University Stadium has real grass, uh, President Mon, that uh, we have real grass. I you don't have real grass. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, say, how can you tell? Well, satellite don't lie. Because the RGB, uh, RGB plus in your infrared, when uh, Purdue uh, grass showed up, it's a healthy red color. <laughs> and what they have, nah. -uh. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that uh, the sensor package that you have, you know, different bands, you have, that's what is, uh, you know, the, the sensor gonna uh, help you, that's what the AI that you train gonna help you, okay? We can not only tell whether it's in a fake tree or real tree, we can tell what species they are. So while my PhD students are working on uh, identify species of different kind at Martel, right? And the AI model has been trained is that on leaf one in the <coughs> fall, there's a tree, we can tell, put it, give it a winter image, this still comes somehow, I can tell that tree. Okay. So, and then uh, back to your, your second question about, well, things are always changing. What's the point of doing that all the time? Well, of course, it's always changing. 
But what you want to do is you have your best assessment of it. If things are changing, then you know what has changed, right? And so uh, anyway, these are all great questions. And uh, obviously was, you know, maybe spark you to come to sign up and as one of ours and work. Okay. okay. <laughs> So Solomon, I think you've got job security. I think Darmendra, Sunil, and then <coughs> Okay. Yeah, so it's a great presentation. Uh, I had a question on your future predictions. Uh -huh. uh, considering the fact that uh, the SNAP mission has not been a great success, uh, and then similarly other missions by the European Agency has also not been a very successful in measuring worship. Why Purdue is still popular? Well, I, okay. This is, a, this is a great question. Why Purdue? Well, everyone has to try, right? And we have, a, first of all, I have a, uh, uh, President Mon says we're no longer top uh, 10, we're top five. Okay, we're top five. We have top five engineering. We have the one of the top four. Okay, top four. Top <laughs> five four. Yeah. <laughs> So we have our best staff and, and, and professors over here. We have the young talents over here. So people haven't get figured out, we'll give it a try. And we're is not- Is the technology changing too? Yeah, this is, a, this is a new technology. By the way, if you're watching for news, uh, 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 Jim Garrison's student there, they are uh, being highlighted in the most recent Purdue today is that uh, NASA selected that technology and put some sensors already up in the space. So, but uh, what we want is we we'll customize it for forestry mm -hmm. and agriculture that, to make it happen. Great. So, Neil, and I think Michael, then Brian, and then. Okay, we'll get the other one. Yeah, sorry. So, I was inspired to ask a two part question. The first part is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I don't know if ChatGPT can do that. Um, because, and again, I'm saying that the chat, it's, it's like GPT. This is actually GPT, it's a GAN model. So it's generative. Uh, um, uh, but uh, no, this model is, is different. <laughs> but, but the other question I had, and I think fascinating vision, I'm uh, really intrigued about your, your, your vision of influencing the climate by planting trees strategically. Can you say a little bit about what are the technical challenges in being able to transfer some of those? What is the impact of the tree, the climate and growth of trees and so on? So, are you uh, trying to understand your question in terms of planting the trees? How that? How many? Where? And how they are going to impact the climate? Is that? I mean, I mean, I think it's such a wonderful issue to be able to say that we could be strategic about where right. we plant trees to influence climate change. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now I got your point now. Okay, I'll answer this question in two parts as well. <laughs> so uh, the first part is that we have to think locally, right? Um, and the reason saying this is that uh, even like in a city, where to plant the tree will bring the best, most benefits. Because, you know, if a, a neighborhood is already have plenty of them, adding one more tree is not necessarily adding too much more benefit about it. But if you're in another neighborhood that is currently more or less barren, you put it in a tree, you get all the kids play underneath it, you know, that brings more benefit of it. So this is one of the main motivation for our urban tree cutting. Like thinking about, again, you know, uh, an environmental justice and the maximizing benefit and so on. So you want to see where are the current most of them are at and where are the area that of desperate need and you can monitor them. So that's the first part of the answer. Um, the second part of it is, is really a much debate in the currently out, like there's a, two weeks ago, there's a paper in uh, science talking about this exact issue that you're talking about. Should we do using a nature-based solution or should we do an engineering solution? The engineering solution is that we're gonna, you know, ha uh, uh, get high concentrations of, uh, uh, 
CO2 and all that, and we'll put it into a well and we'll take it care for good. Let's use their word. Or you want to do, hey, because it's a net part of CO2 is an actually a valuable commodity, but in a sense, currently people view it as because of global change, right? So this is a, um, a, a solution that is, you know, we want the, the trip and the project that we do with Amazon is trying to show that there's a quantifiable, scalable solution for this. So that, hope, yes. Michael, did you have one? Yeah, so you sort of began to answer some of it because it was related to trees and urban areas and uh, sort of uh, equity issues. So in New York, in New York, in one of those neighborhoods that's considered as a tree desert, and one of the arguments is that the city will often have is well, you have to prove the trees were there before they will be placed. So how can this be used, for example, so it's Washington Heights specifically in support of the yeah. This argument, well, we have to prove that they were there to be replaced so that we will spend the money to replace them. Yeah. And how can this be used to prove that trees were in a place and no longer? Oh, that's an easy problem because. Um, so, like, even just for the planet data, we can uh, uh, back to 20, uh, the earliest, 2011. And you can, <coughs> because it's just computation part, we can do this now, the whole United States, 300 plus cities, at the, re recomputed every time, recomputed, it's about two days worth of time. Training, uh, they took uh, uh, 10 days on 100 GPU, uh, uh, what? 100 A100 100 GPUs, yeah. But the, the imputation is now implementing because the algorithm has been worked through, so it's a relatively a smooth process. Right, I believe Brian was next, and then Lawrence, and then myself. Yeah. Sure. So thank you both for your presentation. You anticipated a lot of my questions, and I appreciate that. Um, and it makes it like a frivolous point to some the digital mapping, but I'm actually interested in that point. Have you anticipated any collaborations with artists or designers to try to improve the state of art with this technology? Oh, uh, you, you, you guys are all great thinkers over here. <laughs> so um, now this is something I always sort of trying to brag about, is that on our team we have professional designers. Uh, that uh, like for the e forest uh, now for us, you know, doc, uh, Dr. Rado Gala in the back, like we think well, we initially had a uh, version of it. It's like, oh, that's ugly. <laughs> 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 and so we now have designers are thinking about like user interface flows and so on. So all of this are part of. And if you have talent, you know, digital forestry is an open community, so you're welcome to join us. So Lawrence Blair and then the young lady in the yellow. Uh, Lawrence Pujol, some research. When I hear what you're talking about, I just think of promise because you're bridging a gap of real unknown right now. I come from the modeling community, the climate modeling community, and we have very low resolution ideas of what the, the forest service are. Now, in the past, we try to predict what they're going to do in the future. And having the digital forestry that you're doing connect up as a baseline truth to the climate models will be a big advance. The other connection I'd love to see made here is with the fire simulations. There's some very advanced fire simulations, but again, the forest condition, the forest characterization is another weak spot. Uh, we have great, great uh, environmental weather forcings for these, but Unless we get the force right, we're not going to get the right answer. So I'd love to connect you with some fire modelers I know to see if we can actually change the game, take it up a whole farm and leave with a better characterization of the forest. So thank you. I really appreciate that comment, Lawrence. Um, I just want to review one more thing that we've been working on. So we're working on a, 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 in a company that does a single photon light accounting. So that that's slightly different. This is a very a special term here. Like the lighter that I showed is what called a linear lighter. You send a, a, a beam of light and then you pass it back. But the the uh, another technology is called SPL. Is that it's just the the send tons of photon and then you receive it gets it. 
So we had them come over, actually, and we have two more companies coming over, um, is that they can do of acquisition of from campus all the way to the uh, Martel Forest and Wabash River to 26. 50 square miles of area, less than an hour. And we can identify on that, we have our algorithm that now identify individual trees and sides of them. And so that will provide you the, the, the landscape level information that probably the fire modeling community is you know, eager to get. And once this kind of technology is getting widely available, algorithm allows you to do way more of this you know, structure information. So we had an actually a special issue in uh, uh, frontiers of ecology and the environment talking about the structure related stuff. So all happy to connect with you. So Claire, and then the young lady in yellow, that's probably the last one because I think there's an event we've got to leave for, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the great question. Um, first of all, the group that ChatGPT says that there's about three trillion trees, um, but it notes that this is you know, reforestation, deforestation being better than what we have. So um, is that, for I guess first question, is that, you know, around what you would say? Um, also, my real question, okay. uh, as inspired by just the help Michael, um, from the reforestation perspective and you know, using this data to guide your plant uh, trees. I'm also curious what recommendations you have for reforestation, maybe even from like, a policy perspective, I think of communities like Washington Heights or even countries like Ireland that used to have 80% tree cover and are now down to 34% tree cover. So how would you recommend communities, countries go about actually using this data for good for reforestation? Uh, that's a huge question. I. Um, First of all, I don't think I qualify to answer this question. Maybe our department head over here maybe have better idea of, uh, but uh, I, I think my point is this, is that, uh, um, you know, the, it's like a restoration, right? You can't go back to a certain point. You're trying to, you, you're not, can be go back to wherever the origin and where the origin is also defined by. So, um, Whatever the current tools that we have, whether it's in, you know the Landsat models that uh, Landsat model can be back in the 70s, or some of the area photos can be back even uh, earlier. But you know these technologies can be al allow us to reconstruct if we wanted to, to the history, like use to where are they and how many were were they right? And so these these can be done. But in terms of actual Willingness and implementation is really in a policy question. Sorry, I cannot direct yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And the final question, the young lady in y'all. Can you talk about how this research has long-term implications for sustainable forestry and sustainability as applied to wildlife or wildlife research? But how do you account for the carbon footprints, fossil fuels, and pollution that go into the creating, maintaining, and training of digital and artificial intelligence? Uh -huh. The carbon footprint of this, um, obviously, it, it is. I mean, you heard about the, the all carbon footprint, even like the running of the uh, uh, Chat GPT. There was something talking about the water usage for Oklahoma. Is that was the place? Because where this is where the the server is located. Um, no, we're not. I, I think in terms of the our footprint. So far, the energy and stuff, maybe the couple of trees that came from the, the, the horticulture park will sustain them. Um, but it's uh, overall, this is an, uh, you, you have to use something to create something, if that answers your question. Do you not think that the creation and cleaning of it could be more dangerous if not? I, I do not think so. Because again, this is a limit. This is actually you, you hit on a very interesting point here. I but I would answer it in a different way in terms of way. So it's not the energies or the computers that are going to go in that cost that much of energy to create the data. But it's rather how we're going to utilize the data can be more dangerous than the energies or the, the stuff that. For example, I can if you tell me your address. I can't tell you how many trees in your backyard, right? And probably, you know, what's the size and so on. Well, 
That means the big brother can watch you all the time if you want it, believe in that way, right? So how you can safeguard this information and make it accessible, but meanwhile, not intruding into the private space? That's the big question that we, you know, I will tell you, I'll finish over here, but I'll tell you a story about last summer when we invited a dozen or so stakeholders come to our uh, annual retreat. We said, we can't do this now. One of the first questions the stakeholders say, so how are we gonna to respond to this in terms of tax and all that? So they are worried about the privacy issues because I can tell you this, this, this can change the game in a big way. All right, let's thank someone.